Hi there, my name is Natalie Jones and I'm the librarian for Souk and Port Renfrew. And with me we have... Nariel Davis and I'm the librarian, the children's librarian at Cowichan Branch. Good, so um, I just wanted to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories of the indigenous people of each of our communities and our service area and also those represented um, in attendance at today's virtual event. I am personally coming to you from Esquimalt and Songhees nations, and I'm fortunate enough to work on Souk Nation, all of whose relationships with the land continue to this day. And I am currently on the land of the Kautzen tribe, whose um, relationship with the land continues to this day. So today we're going to be speaking with Kim Jones and Geely Siegel, who are the authors of I'm Not Dying With You Tonight, which has been our July Books and uh, Beyond book club read. In addition to being authors, Kim is a director and human rights activist, and Geely is a lawyer. Um, both have also been active in addressing racial disparity, which is quite evident in their book, I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. Speaking of their book, it was nominated for the 2020 NAACP Image Awards in the uh, Youth and Teen category. And if you guys haven't had a chance to listen or read the book yet, the ebook is available still with no holds on Overdrive or Libby until July 31st. And it's also available in audiobook format um, at all times with no holds. On the RB Digital. On form. RB Digital, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and um, so uh, if for those who are watching live, just make sure to add any questions in the comments section on the Vancouver Island Regional Library Plus Fans Facebook page. And Stanen, who's behind the scenes, will be moderating the questions and will share them with us um, as we go along. While we might not be able to answer all of your questions today, we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Um, and we'll also be sharing a recording of this conversation afterwards for those who aren't able to attend the live session. Um, just before we go into asking the questions, I also wanted to mention that Geely and Kim met through a book club. Um, so let that act as some further inspiration <laughs> to join some of our book clubs if you haven't done um, so already, because you never know who you're gonna meet. All right, so our first question is, um, how did you guys find the experience of co-writing a story about race relations? Kim, you wanna go first? Or you, want me uh, to? Um, you can go first. Okay. Uh, so it, it was an extraordinary experience, both a positive, I mean, there's always a positive one, but there were also really hard moments. So Kim and I were friends, we met through a book club, as you mentioned, the um, Not So YA book club from Little Shop of Stories in Decatur. And we were friendly before we started writing together. And I think that was a crucial element of how we ultimately ended up having these conversations. But as you can imagine, writing about race relations in America engendered some hard conversations and it required um, that we find a way through those conversations. So as we were working on the book, we ended up coming up with a code word that we would use. We don't tell, and people are now like, oh, what was the code word? We won't tell you because now we use it when we're gossiping. Um, but, but we would say this code word to introduce a difficult question. And it was kind of a way of signaling, you know, that we knew one another, we were coming from a place of love. We were coming from a place of wanting to make the book the best possible book and, and get it right really for each of these characters. But it was also a question that was under-informed or um, under-educated about a particular topic that might be considered offensive in other places. So we would say the code word, and then it was a way to introduce sort of very, what we call brave space discussions, knowing that they were going to be hard and painful. And there were definitely days when we had had enough of each other, where we would be like, don't text me for 48 hours, I need some space, or not, we need a minute. Um, but our, I think we, our friendship has always been our North Star and our guiding light, and we use that as like, that has and always will come first for us. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> she summed it up so well, I have nothing to add. <laughs> well, we can move on to the next question if you want. <laughs> for that one, if you, you sure nothing else to say about that. <laughs> it's, it's a similar kind of question. It goes, um, did you find your partnership influenced the development of the characters? Yes, I think they definitely influence the development of the character. So Gilly and I have this, this um, I guess, I mean, it's comforting for us. I guess it may be odd for some people that whenever we, uh, we either of us, uh, not even either, so we both 
feel anxious often. Um, and whenever we get anxious, we hold hands with each other. Um, and so like that was put into the book, like whenever the girls would get anxious or scared, um, they would hold hands. And that's a very Geely and Kim thing um, to do whenever something is upsetting to one of us or we see the other one upset or we get anxious or we're having a bad day. It's just, we that's how we comfort each other is we hold hands. And so our characters do that. Um, that's probably one of the biggest physical things that I remember um, that got put into the book. But it's oddly enough, there are pieces of our personalities in both of these characters, but not in the way in which people would think, right? I'm a lot more like Campbell than I am Lena. And Geely is definitely a lot more like Lena um, than Campbell in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm which is surprising to people, but it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's very true. Um, some of, you know, Lena's grand ambition and stuff like that. I'm kind of more of a flower child. That's like, we'll see what happens. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of like Campbell and then I'm just like, the day is just happening. It'll turn out how it is. <laughs> like, no, you need a plan. like you need to know what is happening and what, what we're doing yeah. and what are and I'm like do I um <laughs> yeah so, um, we could, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yes I think that's one of the most interesting things to me is that although I predominantly wrote Lena originally and she predominantly wrote Campbell originally we actually were like the opposite you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the handholding. It's we have talked a couple of times, so we haven't seen each other very much since beginning of March, right? When all of the COVID closure started happening. And I think one of the hardest parts, especially as we've begun talking about the book, is not being able to be physically present with one another and not being able to like reach out and put a hand on one another and you know, where are you and how are you and what's going on. So I think for for me, certainly, I think for Kim too, we've talked a little bit. Like that's really one of the hardest parts about this separation is having that physical separation also which we're not used to because we're used to seeing each other bare minimum at least once a week um and at times we've been together like every day when we're touring and and stuff like that and i often would just like go and like stay at geely's house and crash there for a few days and so yes. it's so odd for us to be separated from each other which is interesting because this is about a this is a book that's about bringing girls together. Um, um, and so, and now we've been put in a situation where we've been kind of ripped apart. Um, yeah. So it's been hard balancing that because we really are used to like, like I said, bare minimum, at least seeing each other once a week, if not more. Yeah. yeah. It's been really interesting to see how um, over the course of everything happening with COVID, seeing how people are coming together in unique ways. Like, I, I'm not sure if that's helped inform your writing at all, but um, yeah, it's just interesting that like things that maybe wouldn't have happened before, maybe not happen as often, people are really gravitating towards those sort of elements of their life. Well, it's funny because our writing style is also to write together. Mm -hmm. um, so we tried writing digitally, Five, I can't say that word digitally. Um, <laughs> five, years, five years ago, when we first started this journey of writing together, um, we tried doing like Google Docs and all the things so that we could write in separate spaces, and it just never worked for us. Um, one, because I'm like a little irresponsible and require management, but um, um, <laughs> but you know, we we tried that and it just did not work for us, and we found that we were best when we work together. And so it's like now in this COVID situation, it's like, oh, just figure out a digital option. And it's like, well, we tried a digital option out the gate and realized that it didn't work for us. And so now we're stuck in a situation where that's what we're gonna have to do. And uh, <laughs> no surprise to anyone, we haven't been nearly as productive as we normally are. Source <laughs> books, you're not listening. <laughs> Our second book, we had finished it before COVID, had we not, we would have been in trouble. Oh, yeah. that's so good to know. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting um, that you say that, Kim. It made me really think about the notion that relationships and friendships are things that you nurture, right? And it's what's become very difficult to do in these times is to nurture the relationship. Um, ours and with anybody else that you have in your life. And it's it's really finding those, well, this didn't work and how are we gonna do this and what are we gonna do? And I do, I think that's always a work in progress, especially as the world is changing around us so dramatically. Definitely.
definitely dealing with a different environment and different challenges than we normally would have to face. And how do we and get over those challenges? Yeah. Yeah. I and dread, I dread the day when we have to write a book set in 2020. <laughs> We're just, I, I feel like literature is going to skip over the year 2020. <laughs> feel like that's, that that's didn't just happen. Gonna fall into sci-fi, right? Like there is like meteors hurling and um, killer wasp and, um, a, a, an international pandemic and an international civil unrest. This clearly is a dystopian novel. It's dystopian. It really is. Yeah. Well, there's even been music coming out lately that's like people have already started incorporating that into their lyrics. Oh, I did. I heard a song on the radio just before this about with the word quarantine in it, and I was like, that was new. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to see over the next few months, like, what more, um, like, work artists are coming out with. That'll be interesting. Oh, and don't forget UFOs. We've now been oh. <laughs> all in one, all in a matter of six months. We've had yep. UFOs, sand from the Sahazer go across the world, a meteor that almost hit us, a yep. global pandemic, a global civil unrest, and was it killer? What was it? Kill was it killer bees or killer wasps? Killer wasps, I think. Wasp, I think. Yeah, killer wasp <laughs> attack. Oh, and don't forget the Great Brush Fire of Australia. Australia. So it's been a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a lot. Also, I have a friend. We, Kim and I, have a mutual friend who just posted something about dinosaurs saying they, um, uh, scientists saying they might be able to recreate dinosaurs within the next five years. And I was like, I, I've been, uh, I was like, because 2020, and also I've been overusing my Jurassic Park gifts for the last couple of days, just being like, guys, nope, nope, nope on the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. Nope well, right out of that. Dinosaurs. I, I am excited about the UFOs and <laughs> I just want the pod people to just take me at this point. <laughs> Sorry, oh, we went on a tangent. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know what? It, there is a lot going on in the world, and then it just means there's a lot going on for people personally as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you guys had just mentioned uh, your characters and your relationship to those, um, to each Lena and Campbell. Um, so authenticity of not only the characters but the story itself is a major feature of your book. What steps did you guys uh, take to make sure your story was as realistic as possible? And we, um, Nariel and I had researched that you guys um, went in and talked to um, youth and educators and librarians. And um, so if you want to just touch on that a little bit too. Yeah. Well, can you tell them about your cool SWAT experience? I did. So two of the things that we did, and I'll talk about one of them, Kim will talk about the other one, was research with people who had um, lived through riots, so riot survivors. And also um, we did some research with SWAT and the police to figure out like, how does this scenario really become the widespread unrest that you see in the book? Um, at the time, our inspiration were some of the things that were happening in 2015, 2016, Ferguson, um, Baltimore, Charlottesville, Charlotte, so I went and researched with a SWAT team who spent about four hours talking with me about where do the police stage and what's happening, you know, how, how do pockets of riot, um, unrest really become this widespread violence? And they were really gracious with their time. They spent a lot of time telling us kind of where they would be, what where they would be staging. Uh, they asked to see a copy of our map. They were like, all right, well, you're happy. I mean, this whole thing happened in this particular neighborhood, where's your map? And fortunately, we had this, like, this flimsy little yellow legal pad piece of paper that we had scribbled out a map on. And I was like, yeah, SWAT, here's our map. Um, and <laughs> interestingly enough, they really, they, they showed us where things would be happening. Uh, and they helped us with a couple of plot points. Oddly enough, originally, we had a character who meets the girls about a quarter of the way into the book who was a news reporter and he played the role of, of warning the girls that something big was happening in the area that they were headed towards and they probably shouldn't go there. And the SWAT officer was instantaneously like, no responsible adult meets these characters at this point in the story and knows that there's really widespread unrest ahead and lets them keep going by themselves. So your book ended right here on this street. And we were like, hmm, that's a fair point, SWAT officer. Um, and we ended up replacing that with someone who has become a beloved character, Cousin Marcus. Uh, so yeah, so SWAT actually played an integral role in helping us plot this novel. 
And Kim, you had some experiences as well? Yeah, so I talked to some um, riot survivors. So I talked to a riot survivor from Ferguson. I also talked to a riot survivor from the LA riots. And then Geely had shared some information with me about her aunt who was in the Philadelphia riots. And so we had this like, you know, we had the 60s and the, and the, 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 eight, the I guess uh, LA riots was like late 80s, early 90s. Um, and then, you know, more recent with what happened in Ferguson. And so we had really interesting conversations with them about what that experience was like. And, and one of the ones who struck me the most was the, the young the gentleman who survived the LA riots, who was a teenager. He was the age of our characters at the time in which the LA riots happened. And he talks about how he got out of school one day and it was going on and he was trying to get home. And this is pre-cell phone. Um, and so he just had to like continuously stop at pay phones and use a calling card for the young people watching. A calling card um, was, it looks like a little credit card. And if you needed to make a phone call at a pay phone and you didn't have change, you could put in the number and it would allow you like a credit card to charge your that phone call to your family's uh, phone bill of their um, landline phone, which I'm thinking you've probably seen on a TV show before. Um, <laughs> So um, he was using this calling card and he was living with his grandmother and how he continuously along the way would stop at pay phones to let his grandmother know how far he had gotten and how closer he was to getting home safe. Um, but what, one of the things that struck us because it lined up with what SWAT was talking to Geely about was that he said there were so many pockets of unrest throughout LA, even though, you know, the way they showed it on TV and stuff looks like it's all happening in this kind of like saturated area. There were pockets of it that were all over the city. And so every time he got to a pay for a clearing and got to a pay phone and called his grandma and was like, I found a clearing and I'm okay. I just got to keep going. He'd go a few blocks and find himself in another pocket. And he'd have to fight through that to get to the next clearing. Um, and that really aligned with what SWAT was saying about how it had to happen in pockets. And so that's when we were like, oh, they have to survive multiple riots, like for it to be authentic. This has to happen. They can't just like leave a riot and it's over. It's like, no, there, there will be civil unrest throughout the city and they may run into it in different places. And that's extra stressful having to stop every once in a while just to like go physically to the phone, mm. the phone booth and do that, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Been quite an experience, quite to live through. Yeah. <laughs> and we got, we got a glimpse of that with your book, which is, we really appreciate that, thank you. Um, what do you hope this book will show your audience about perspective, given that it does represent some of those experiences? Well, this is a book about perspective. Um, I think a lot of times people say that this is a book about race, but it's actually a book about perspective. Um, because the thing that unifies these girls are that they are both female. And so um, they are both all too familiar with the omnipresent threat to the feminine form. Um, we often say that if either of these characters had been male or male presenting, book ends at like chapter one. It's not as interesting. There's not, the journey is not the same. The threat is not the same mm -hmm. as it is with um, two, uh, you know, with two people who identify as female traveling along this journey. Um, and so although their culture and their background and their rearing informs their perspective, the fact that they're both female unifies them in terms of perspective. And so the perspective is not only theirs, but it's also the perspective of, of the men um, in the book. You know, Cousin Marcus has a totally different perspective on how they should be behaving in this moment. Um, and so, you know, um, when they stop and they see Ms. Johnson, Ms. Johnson is fearful. Um, that's part of that understanding that two girls should not be out in this moment unprotected and alone. Um, and that's like Geely said, that's why we had to get rid of the reporter, right? Because the, the perspective of a reporter would have like ended it and said, this is it. So we needed to add someone who was, you know, slightly older, like, I'm going to take the journey with you because I feel weird, but also still not mature enough just to say, dead that, you're staying here with me. I'm going to call one of my friends to take you. He's, he still doesn't, you know, people don't realize it's been scientifically proven that your brain doesn't actually cement in the way in which you identify as adults in your decision making until you're 25. So Marcus is like 22. 
So he still doesn't even have all of the lived experience to manage the situation better. He only manages it slightly better than them and in some ways not at all. Um, and so the book is full of people who have interesting perspectives and what that looks like and how differently they're seeing this moment and how their lived experience is informing this moment for them. Yeah. I think it's also a book about, about who do we perceive to be heroes? Because I think, I mean, Lena is the hero of this story and Campbell also has some badass moments in the book. And I, you know, I think if you were to set up you know, a Zoom meeting of 30 people and ask someone to point out the heroes, I wonder whether they would point to these two girls, but in reality, they really are heroes, right? They save themselves. They save themselves. They absolutely do. And they do it in partnership with each other, an unlikely partnership. And so in part, I hope that people take away from this book, the ability to look at someone that they wouldn't have stereotypically perceived to be a hero and see in them heroic qualities, especially because they are female characters. We fall sometimes into this very narrow perception of what um, female heroism looks like. And a lot of times it's, a tr it's ascribing male characteristics, traditionally masculine characteristics. Um, and so I, I hope that people see these girls and are like, yeah, they're, they're badass. They come through this night together and they do, they do okay. Yeah. Yeah. My colleagues and I were just um, talking about a book yesterday called The Rest of Us Just Live Here by Patrick Ness. I love that book so much. Oh, really? Okay, that's really good to know. It's on my um, to be read pile. And um, yeah, it's if for those who are watching who aren't familiar, it's um, looking at the people in stories that aren't necessarily the heroes, but um, are still very valuable and wonderful people. Okay, I'm glad for your recommendation because now I want to <laughs> read it as soon as possible. Yes. Good. Um, so our next question, uh, and I should mention as well for those watching live, if you want to comment any questions below and we'll try to get um, to them at some point during the interview. Um, all right, so the you two- touch, You touched on the one question, uh, our viewer question we have had coming in. Why don't, sure. we, why don't we bring that in now and then we can move on with some of the other questions. Sure. So we did have one of the viewers ask, how do you write a novel with another author? What is the process? Carefully. <laughs> uh, so so for, I, there is, so number one thing with writing, there's no one right way to do it, right? There's only the way that works for you. And the way that works for you for one book might not be the way that works for you for another book. So I will tell you what our process was in hopes that it inspires something in you, but please don't take this as us saying this is the way to do it because there's lots of ways. Yeah. Yeah. So for Kim and I, we, because the story is told in dual, is a dual perspective from two different character, dual narrative from two different perspectives. In the first draft, we each predominantly took responsibility for one of the characters and we would alternate chapters and swap back and forth. But relatively quickly, sort of by the middle of the first draft, end of the first draft, we realized that as Kim had mentioned before, that process really didn't work for us. Um, and because our characters interact within one another's chapters, um, in order to get the voices right within each other's chapters, in order to have a smooth narrative, we really needed to work together side by side. So we completed revisions, literally sitting side by side and line by line working on each, um, on each chapter. Yeah. Yeah, and we we definitely like just took time to figure out the systems that worked for us. Um, and one thing that like Geely always talks about, I'm stealing her line now, is that um, <laughs> is that you know compromise doesn't always mean that you meet in the middle. Sometimes the person with like the strongest idea or the strongest sentiment wins, and that's the compromise is that you know that that's what's what it's going to be and so the book is better for it um than some like watered down middle ground that's like not working yeah oh the other thing is um lean into each other's strengths right everybody brings to a creative project strengths and weaknesses right so kim um it is a blessing to work with her she is a master of dialogue and pacing it comes from her background in, in the film and television world and screenwriting. And she would just bring these, you know, all of the fabulous quips that you see throughout the book. It's all Kim. Um, and she, she really brings this gorgeous dialogue. And so we leaned into that. And it was like, I would be writing a chapter and it would be like seven pages of description. And she would be like, this is not a Jane Austen novel. Let's have some words in there. 
So like really be honest with yourselves and each other about what your um, strengths and weaknesses are. <laughs> Sorry, my son. Um, uh, lean into what your strengths and weaknesses are as authors and like use that to build a stronger scaffolding to work together. Yeah, and on the flip side, like I'm a screenwriter, so I would send Gilly like pages and pages of dialogue, and she'd be like, "This is a script. This is not a novel." Um, and so, where are they? What are they looking at? What are they seeing? What does that look like? How did they get there? And I'm like, "I don't know. I couldn't figure out how to get them there." And she's like, "Well, they could do this," and you know, um, <laughs> and so yeah, like we and and you know, it doesn't. Um, you have to like put ego aside if you're going to work with someone. You can your ego cannot be the third author, um, or in our case, the third and fourth author. You know what I mean? And so you have to know, like, okay, Geely is amazing at you know at story structure and interiority and 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 that type of thing. We're both equally good, I think, at character development. I'm good at dialogue, and so it wasn't like. Oh, you're you're you know you're you don't have faith in me because you won't let me write this interiority. It's like I suck at that. Can you figure out how to get us there? And she's like, this sounds like a forty year old, not a seventeen year old. Can you fix it so that the dialogue is working? And so you know, it, it made it work better. But that you are, if you're gonna write with someone, you have best check your ego at the door and be prepared to like discover each other's strengths and weaknesses and what process works for you, and lean into that. And again, like she said earlier, does that mean that you know we didn't have some days where we bumped head and we're like, you suck? Yes, we had those days. But I can honestly and legitimately say those days were rare. Yeah. They were also proving my point live and in real time, how brilliant is you cannot let your ego be the third author. I yeah. love that. I'm putting it on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, let me know if you're selling that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe I'll just gift it to you. <laughs> I would do. Um, so throughout the book, uh, the two girls show different types of courage. Is there ever a situation where you felt like your courage was tested? I mean, all the time, right? I, you know, fi uh, not with respect to writing the book specifically, but living in the era when, that we live in when speaking up and speaking out is a critical part of how I want to move through the world in the future, having the courage to speak out to friends, I think is one of the hardest thing and to family and to those people. So those spaces um, where you, that you sort of call home, um, having the courage to, to correct people and to call people in and ask them to be better is that takes courage. And sometimes that's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, even as, even as writers, sometimes it's difficult because you want to put things on the page that are authentic and true, but you have to like say, will, um, can this be removed out of context and will it hurt me if it's, if it's, if someone just grabs this blurb and puts it in an interview? Um, is this, this is true to my lived experience, but is it offensive to a group of people? Um, how do I, how do I correct that or check that? Um, this is, this is, you know, for me, especially like writing Lena, who's a hood girl, like I'm a hood girl, but there are a lot of people who feel that the hood girl narrative is not something that should be written. And that's not just people outside of my community, that's people within my community. And so I had to accept that some people were going to give me pushback on that. And they did. Um, and, but I just felt like for me and girls who grew up like me, like someone has to write a tale or two for us, you know, um, and it can't, I couldn't just leave Angie Thomas to do it on her own. She couldn't, she couldn't carry that burden by her, her and Tiffany Jackson can't carry that burden by themselves. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's putting any kind of art, out. even if you are writing a funny rom-com, it's scary. Yeah. It's it's a courageous act to present art to the world, to invest your heart so wholeheartedly into something and then leave it to the world to like beat it up and pick it apart. Um, you got you got to like muster up some strength to do that, because not everyone's going to think that you are a little dark. You're not going to be everybody's little darling. You're just not. Yeah. Super true. I looked at my Wikipedia page the other day, which is interesting because, you know, Wikipedia, it's, you know, 
anybody can contribute to it. And it's like the one review someone chose to put in the Wikipedia page about our book was a bad review. And I was like, there's 50 reviews. You picked this one? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, um, on a positive note, speaking of Angie Thomas, just want to remind people out there that that is the prize we're going to be giving away. The Hit You Give is the prize we're giving to members of the book club. We'll do a draw in a, a little while. So all you need to do is be a, be a part of this book club to be able to be eligible to win that, a copy of the Hate You Give. Ooh, fantastic prize. Yes. I pretended to be Angie Thomas one day. How'd it go? <laughs> it was successful, they believed me. <laughs> Either do you want to tell them about the day I was <laughs> banging Angie Thomas? I'll tell them about the day. So this is an event we did, I forget where now, we did a quite in a Arizona. few- Arizona. Oh, in Arizona. And, yeah. a, and they promoted this. So Angie was generous and kind enough, Angie, who's an amazing author and person, was kind enough to blurb our book. And so for one of the promotional posters, um, the Angie's blurb was kind of at the very top of the poster. And a, this lovely book club of charming women saw it and thought that it was an Angie Thomas event and did not realize it was, our event because really what they looked at was the blurb at the top and so they showed up at the event and sheepishly afterwards approached us and said we turned up because we thought this was going to be an angie thomas event well the funny thing is before that even happened there was a woman who was in the store who gave me all the indication that she thought i was angie thomas and i still let her take a photograph of me and leave thinking I was Angie Thomas. <laughs> well, you know what, a, like a good moment out of all of that is that it just got more exposure for your book. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, there's some really great topics covered in both. So I think it's, I think it's a, a good conversation to have either way. <laughs> we always say that if you take that riot scene from the hate you give, like that that snapshot moment and you pulled it out and blew it up, that's I'm not dying with you tonight. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of Angie Thomas and other people who are important to our, our writing and our lives, how, who have been the allies in your life and how have you practiced allyship for others? Gilly is the ally in my life. <laughs> Same, <laughs> no, but same, really. Like one of the things, so I'm Jewish um, and we learned a lot about one another's cultures when we were going through the process of writing these books. And, and I, I think in no small part, the I mentioned at the beginning that we have what we call a brave space, right? Where we can ask each other the hard questions. Um, part of being an ally is being a friend to the community that you are seeking to ally with, right? Ally is not a badge, particularly for white people, right? Ally is not a badge that I get to anoint myself with and be like, I'm an ally and everything is fine. Um, it's a, it is a journey of learning that continues forever. Um, <laughs> yes, that, that is my ally crown. Do you see it? That's um, your ally crown. Also, that's my that's ally crown. Ally. Also, and then it's, and now, now forevermore, and I never make mistakes. I mean, that's a, we all want to be that, but but that's not the way that it works, right? We don't get to anoint ourselves with that. We we have to earn it all the time. And learning how to be an ally, learning to listen first, learning to take correction, learning that you are going to get it wrong, you are going to make mistakes, and you know you have to be brave enough to accept the correction and learn and go forward and do better next time. Is a crucial part of being an ally. Um, and it's up to the community that you are seeking to ally, be an ally to, to determine whether you are successful or not. You know, you don't get to determine that my, this is good allyship. That is something that you earn and that the community that you're seeking to support decides. Yeah, and I think, you know, people ask us often, like, what did we learn of, you know, um, as we were writing the book. And I think that is the most important thing that we learned because we were friends before we started working, writing the book, we weren't, we weren't as close as we are now. And so along that journey, we learned a lot about each other. But as Gili mentioned, I learned so much about Jewish culture um, from spending time with her. And I also, and here's one of the things that I learned that was most important was 
removing myself from leading the charge when there is an issue within her community that I am I am the second seat in that conversation um it is not my job as an ally to like put my shield on and load up on the horse and say I will save you um it is my job to first come to her and say I am going to be quiet now I am going to listen I am going to ask for your advisement in this moment, and I am not going to do anything because I don't have the lived experience to really know if what I'm doing is helping or harming you. And if there is something that you require of me, I will do it as you see fit and as you inform me to do it. Thanks. So for I'm Not Dying With You tonight, we um, are encouraging people, um, we'll be making a post in the next couple of days about it, but we're encouraging people to create their own allyship toolkit so that they can pick a topic that they feel strongly about and then they can um, do some self-reflecting and discover how they can be a better ally, what areas of um, strength and weakness they have around being an ally and what that looks like to them. Um, so for example, I created my own menstrual allyship toolkit because I feel very passionately about um, menstrual activism and um, we have some other ones on accessibility and it, it, it just provided the staff that we're working on it a lot of self-reflection. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you guys have any advice um, to give to people on being who want to be allies in regards to racial inequality or any topic? Um, so I would say interrogate where are you personally are before you determine where to start, right? So as Kim, as Kim said, right, it's, you have to listen to the community, but we all aren't starting in the same place. Are you someone who has been aware of these issues for a while and is ready to start taking action outside of yourself? Are you someone who has never talked about this before in their lives? Are you someone who comes from a family that's, you know, super socially justice oriented and, and or are you the person who's like, I'm uncomfortable going home um, for family holiday dinner because I know I'm gonna be contending with a lot of racist family members. So interrogate where you are on the spectrum yourself, right? Don't seek that from the community you're seeking to support, right? Don't turn to the black community and say, how do I help you? Figure out where you are on the spectrum first and start there. That's my number one thing. Yeah, I, I wanna echo that sentiment. Is like a lot of allyship work is self work. Um, you know, it's like, I cannot combat like homophobia um, until I know where I am in that spectrum of conversation um, and then kind of like grow from there. Also, because as a, you know, as a cisgender heterosexual woman, I am part of the collective group that created homophobia. People who are queer did not create homophobia. It was hetero people who created homophobia. So doing the inner work on making sure that I am right in that, that space is step one. Because if I just decide that's bad and I'm gonna move forward, I may not even have the proper language to be supportive of that community if I haven't done the, you know, if I haven't done the work myself first. Um, one of the things that I do on my Instagram page for people who want to be an allyship of the black community is I do this thing called Tuesday Task, where I give people three tasks centered around one point. Um, and it'll be um, something I require them to research, something they need to watch or read, and then an organization that they can support. Um, because it's like self-education is where everyone needs to start. Um, you know, don't, I tell people this all the time, like don't start a fight on Instagram with someone and then say, you should, you should listen to Kim Jones and tag me. I don't need any more trolls. I have <laughs> plenty of my own already. Um, if you are ready, if you think you're ready to start having Instagram or Facebook fights with people, then the first thing you need to do is arm yourself with the information to be able to have that fight on your own without expecting me to come in and close the deal for you. So if you are not in that space where you could have that agreement and then win it with the facts and the statistics and the things that you can form yourself with, you're not ready for that fight. So education, 
like with all things, is key and first. Yep. Um, in addition to Kim's Tuesday tasks, which are awesome and eye-opening, and you should follow her, but don't attract the trolls, um, I can't <laughs> if specifically what you are wanting to do is join the conversation about white supremacy, I cannot recommend enough the book Me and White Supremacy by Leila Saad. Um, she's our publishing sister from Sourcebooks. It is both a book and there's also a workbook that you can do, and it is an excellent example of how you do the difficult, um, painful inner work to, to acknowledge your own participation in white supremacy. So I would also highly recommend that. And we do have that book available through the library too, if anybody's looking. Thank you guys both. Those are some great resources. We're going to have to see if we can provide links to on the Facebook page afterwards. Um, given recent events, would you have written anything in the book differently if you rewrote it now? Eerily enough, some of the stuff that we wrote actually happened. Spooky. Yeah. But I don't know if we would rewrite them. Um. Yeah. Uh, my answer is no, right? I, I think... <sighs> The, the book was always intended to be plot. It's not a one particular real event, right? It's inspired by real events. It's inspired by a number of different things that have happened. But if you look at the continuum of, of where people are, like the book is a reflection of where we were a couple of years ago. I hope that there's another book that somebody writes. I like to think of all these books, right? Our book, Dear Martin, um, The Hate You Give, um, American All Boys. American Boys. They're in conversation with each other. And they are reflective of a continuum of conversations. And so I hope a couple of years from now, there's another book that is part of this conversation and in conversation with our books that is inspired by how things have tra transpired since. But personally, I don't think I would change anything at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so books have clearly played an important part of your lives. Is there any aspect of libraries that you feel um, are especially important at this time? I think when we're we're having conversations around the world about part of why people are concerned about whether or not children are going to school is because some kids only get a healthy meal um, from the from from breakfast and lunch that they get at school. Um, I think then if you if you know that there are children out there who don't have meals to eat, then there are most certainly children out there who don't have access to books. Um, we used to run an amazing program in um, in Decatur, um, which was on the same page, which was a citywide reading initiative. And there were kids who were on free or reduced lunch who were able to get the book in the city of Decatur school system who were able to get the book for free for their families to participate in the citywide read. And one of the um, one of the women who I'm very close with, um, Sunny, and also Krista, who ran that program, once said to me that they would have kids that would come up to them and say that this is the first time that they had owned a book of their own, was the book that they got from on the same page. Um, and so when you think about that, what the library system can mean to someone um, in terms of giving them access to the world through a book, like we cannot lose libraries, we need them. Um, and librarians are such a critical part in a child's development. My mother on Saturday mornings would drop me off sometimes. I, I still remember my library, Carter G. Woodson Library in Chicago. Um, she would sometimes drop me off there on a Saturday morning and just leave me. And the librarians were very kind to be like, this lady just left her 11 year old running around in the library, driving us all nuts. Um, it was the 80s, it was a different time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she would get arrested now if she did that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and, but it was my place to explore and to, to learn new things and be in different worlds and and see a new perspective and 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 learn about new people and new food and all these things and these patient poor guys about these patient librarians who was stuck with someone else's child for four hours on a Saturday morning. Um, were women who were excited to introduce me to new things and, and using this as a space to educate in their own way. And so I think the, the libraries are pivotal for all people, but particularly for poor people who this may be their only access to a book. Yeah, yeah I mean, libraries are critical community resources, absolutely critical. Uh, 
I'm a bit, curriculum is great and I'm a big advocate of curriculum, but I'm also a really big advocate of choice in reading, right? So um, especially for the youth of today, I think when you get to go to the library and you have the entire bookshelf to select from and you get to pick what's interesting to you, that's a really powerful tool to get kids in particular to connect to reading, right? So if, if what we're handing them isn't interesting and engaging to them, letting them select what they want to read is a really great way to get kids reading whatever it is. And that's a really important component. And I can't think of a better place to do that than at the library, um, where the librarian doesn't necessarily have a vested interest in you selecting a book that's from the approved curriculum. And they're invested in you picking a book that's going to connect and that you're going to love. And so you can tell them what you're into. And they're going to be like, here, let me hand you this thing that you might be interested in. So to that point as well, I, I think, um, or unfortunately, oftentimes people neglect certain types of books because they don't think it's at their, um, what they should be at in terms of ability level. So I think it's very valued and justified if you want to read a graphic novel or listen to audiobooks, you're still consuming information and that it's still a really valuable um, resource to have. Yeah, no offense, teachers, but boo reading levels, right? Like, and I see this in my own household, right? I, I just want my kids to read. So I have one kid who is an accelerated reader. Like she's reading at a college level and she's in middle school and that's fantastic. And I'm super excited for her. And I have another reader who's a really struggling reader, right? Like he, he has a hard time connecting with books. And I'm like, I don't care what you read. He loves Dogman, which is technically below his quote unquote reading level. But also when he picks it up, he is capable of sitting down on the spot and spending an hour and a half looking at those pages and reading that book and engaging with the text. And so I'm like, just read it. That's, that's all I want. I don't care what it is. Graphic novels are wonderful books that are quote, below your quote unquote reading level. Just engage with the text. Well, on that great note, we do have a question from one of our viewers. Out of the books you have written, how difficult was this book to write compared to the others? Trying to get the ideas and uh, ideas emotional, challenging, all these different things. How, how did it compare to the other books that you've written? Well, we have 2.5 books. <laughs> one is in the world. Um, <laughs> um, so we have, I'm not dying with you tonight, which is in the world. We have our second book, which doesn't really have a title yet, um, which we finished and turned in, but are in the editing process. And then we have a short story that we are writing together for an anthology. So that's the point five is the short story for the anthology. Um, it's crazy because this book, I'm not dying with you tonight, took a lot longer than the others are going to take, but I feel like it was the easiest. I feel like we've struggled a lot more um, with our sophomore book and we haven't even been able to wrap our head around starting on our short story yet, especially because again, we've been put in a position where the way in which we write is not possible. And so we're, we're confused on how to get the, the, engine, <laughs> the engine going on that. Um, but our second book I think was harder to write. I don't know, what do you think Keely? I completely agree. I mean, I think this book was emotionally difficult because uh, it was subject matter that's really important to us and also, you know, emotional and charged subject matter. But like in terms of the plotting and the writing and all of that, like I feel like that was relatively easy and straightforward. The second book has been significantly harder. It was, I think it was a lot harder for us to find the heart of that story um, and then plot it. We spent a lot of time swirling around the plot. <laughs> with that one, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the subject matter? Was it fairly similar on, on addressing it? And what about the books that you've written individually separate from the ones that you've written together? Our second book is still on brand. So it's still a book about race relations. It's still a book told in a dual narrative between two girls, one black and one white. Our short story is just a fun story. It has, there's nothing serious about it at all. <laughs> It's just yeah. a, it's just, it's a comedy, it's a romp. It's a, a very, very um, silly thing. I am currently working on, Geely, when she writes solo, she writes mysteries. So that's totally different. And I am writing um, as, as my solo work is nonfiction. So we're kind of all over the place. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the mysteries are kicking my butt. So compared to the mystery, <laughs> this is a joyful, writing with Kim is always a joyful experience. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm writing nonfiction, which is like doing schoolwork because I have to fact check. And I'm like, my book right now that I'm writing is on um, uh, economics in the Black community. So I'm having to consult with an economist and historians. And it's, it, I have teachers and it's, it's school. This, when I write with Gilead, it doesn't feel like school. It feels like fun and passion. And this, my new book, although I love it and I'm excited for people to get it, I'm just like, this is school and I don't like it. <laughs> Well, you two met in a book club. What do you feel a book club adds to the reading experience or can add? I have a cheater answer. <laughs> it's not so, it's about community for me, right? Like I joined the book club where I met Kim looking for a community. I was an adult who had recently come back to reading young adult novels. I spent a long time um, pretending that I was, you know, sort of doing the whole, oh, young adult is not for me, um, snobbery, which I don't subscribe to. Uh, and then I found this book club at the Little Shop of Stories, which was a whole bunch of other adults um, around my age who unabashedly loved reading young adult novels. And it felt like finding my crew. And so for me, what book clubs create is community. Mm -hmm. I probably should have answered something about deep meaning of the text, but it's about friends. Yeah. And our book club likes to go out to like have dinner afterwards, which is really cool. <laughs> Who Who oh, that's that? we, <laughs> we also found each other in that book club right like our book club had a bunch of aspiring authors in it and so they would organize writing retreats every couple of months where we would go off and like rent a shared cabin in the north georgia mountains and and write together and that's how kim and i found each other so and oddly enough of that book club i can't even count how many people in that book club are now published a lot. And we weren't yeah. published when we all started. When we first started, only one member of the book club, Lauren Morrow, um, was published. And now there's a bunch of us who are published from that book club. Um, Myra is in that book club. And um, Rachel, is, was Rachel ever in that book yep. club? Rachel she Allen. Appeared. Um, lots of YA authors are <laughs> now the root of the Not So YA Book Club, which is what we were called. Mm -hmm. I read almost exclusively YA fiction. I feel like <laughs> I just find the characters, I don't know, like there's a lot of really wonderful adult literature, but I think YA authors just have a way of writing characters so realistically and you like can really relate to people. I like yeah. it. Um, so as a field, librarianship and library work is often underrepresented by minority populations. Do you guys have any suggest suggestions for strategies the library field can take to combat this? Hmm. It's a big question, I know. It's a, a large field issue and I'm sure it's present in many fields and not just library work, um, but we just wanted to ask and see if you guys have any suggestions. <laughs> we were both like, well, uh, you want to go first? Um, yeah, I think the number one thing is to be intentional about disrupting that. Um, I think that we, you know, we came from this like really phony baloney colorblind society about 15 years ago where it was like to acknowledge that you need to do something was the ins insult when the actual insult is to do nothing um so i think being intentional about hey i'm in this room and i don't feel this room is representative of my world what are we going to do about that um is the best way that people can start i also think <clears throat> recognizing sort of the four pillars of justice, equality, diversity, diversity, and inclusion, what that really means, right? And it's when we, when you're in the hiring process, and I learned this from the corporate world, because I have a, a day job in the corporate world, and they are very uh, thoughtful and desirous of being, desire, they desire to be a more inclusive and equitable workplace. And so asking ourselves things like, when we are hiring, is it, are we hiring people who quote unquote fit in, right? And oftentimes what you are doing is um, introducing implicit bias into your hiring processes. Or when you're forming a committee, are we picking people who fit in or are we picking culture ads? And when we start thinking about not 
fitting in, which oftentimes means more representation of what I already bring to the table, but adding what I don't know, what I don't bring to the table, things that are other than my lived experience is when we can start um, really creating space at the table and then making sure that once we have created space at the table, uh, that it remains an inclusive space, an equitable space where people who are bringing different life experiences are not shut down for speaking their truth and speaking up and calling in and things like that. Sure. Thank you. We appreciate you guys sharing some information from your lived experiences. Um, we know we've already touched on this a bit, but I am going to still ask the question because we might have missed some things. What can you tell me a bit about your future projects? You have a book coming out. Can you tell us a bit about that book or is there anything else also in the works besides, of course, the short story? Um, um, we don't have a title or anything, but we've already told the world what our book is about, so we can definitely tell you. It is about two girls, one black, one white, two cheerleaders to be specific, um, who take a knee at on a Friday night at their high school football game and the fallout from it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, so you all can tell, tell source books online that you want to be able to release the title soon. Yes. Tell, tell them you want to know um also our first book i'm not dying with you tonight the film rights have been optioned yeah. so they are working on turning that into a movie can we ask what company they've been auctioned they, oh is it still in the process no 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 it's radar radar entertainment yeah okay yeah they're the they did the most recent jumanji mm -hmm. we'll have to keep our eyes open for that one yes how about as um individual authors is there a project you guys are working on coming up um, I am working on a book called How Can We Win, which is basically an extension of my my lecture, if you will, from my viral video. And it's a nonfiction book, and that'll be out spring 2021 if I ever finish it. <laughs> uh, and same, I'm working on my mystery, which is not sold to anybody yet. Publishers, call my agent, really, call me. Um, but ho hopefully someday, you know, 2022 or beyond, you'll see a mystery novel for me. That's wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Um, I want to give a little more space in case we have any questions from our from our, our readers and our viewers. Um, so we'll give a few more seconds. If people do have a question, please do add it to the Facebook page chat room. We'll make sure we get it on um, here for the next few minutes. And then we will be posting this video, of course, up and that'll be you'll be able to view it anytime. But last chance to answer any questions that you might have. I have a quick question for Geely. Um, is your mystery book going to be YA? Because I've been really into the Truly Devious series and Charlotte Holmes. I would love more YA mystery. Yes, yay, I'm so glad you said that. It is. <laughs> it's, I, it's, it's inspired by the Serial podcast, right? I really like the way that Serial deconstructs mysteries. So I describe it as I'm like, you, you start out the book knowing what you think happened and then we deconstruct it throughout. So if, if I manage it, <laughs> right? <laughs> writing books is hard. Way hard. Well, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to Kim and to Geely for joining us for this author visit today. It is clear that your book has started some great conversations, both with external audiences and thoughts conversations internally as well. As Natalie has mentioned, our Books and Beyond uh, book club will be ending with a call to action, uh, which in, in this month we're asking readers to create their own allyship toolkit. And we'll be posting more information about how you can get started on this task, and on our Facebook page in the coming days, along with some examples of the ones we made. Um, starting in August, we will be featuring three new books um, to our book club. Our Shared Shelf Book Club will be featuring, for, which is for children's and families, will be featuring The Case of the Missing Moonstone by George Stratford. Our Take a Break Book Club, for people seeking lighthearted or inform informative reads, will be featuring What If by Randall Monroe. And this book club, Books and Beyond, will be featuring uh, I Am Still Alive by Kate Ann Marshall. And you can find out more information about these books on our website, virl.bc.ca. 
And uh, we also will be having our continuing our adult summer reading challenge until the end of August. So please check out the website for further information. We'll also be still having our teen summer challenge web uh, ch challenge happening throughout the summer, as well as our summer reading club for our younger, our younger viewers and readers. Um, lastly, we will be drawing for book club and beyond book club prize this week. So please do check back for an announcement as to who wins a copy of The Hate You Give. And if you're not in the book club, please join so that you can be eligible for the, this draw. Um, I don't see any new questions coming in, but so we're going to we're going to leave it there. But thank you both both for taking your time today and for sharing with us a bit more about your writing and yourselves. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. This was actually, I think, our first joint Canadian appearance. So way to start us off. Fantastic. This was a blast. Thank you. Yep. Well, welcome to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, invite us back when we're all allowed to travel. <laughs> yes, when we're allowed to travel, you guys are our neighbors. We can come to Canada. <laughs> Love and it. I don't know if you guys have seen anything about Vancouver Island on a map, but it's, in my opinion, the most beautiful part of our whole country. <laughs> well, that's even more reason why Gila and I need to come and visit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're there. As soon as we can travel, just send us an invite. We'll be there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you guys for having us. Bye. Thanks for coming.